tonight to Romans chapter number 8. Uh, this brings us to a conclusion. These verses, verses uh, 30 through verse 39, brings us to a conclusion of the doctrinal aspect of these eight chapters. Paul has laid a foundation down uh, that's second to none concerning our sanctification and concerning, concerning the things that we are, uh, that we have in Christ Jesus, our precious Lord. Uh, before I get into this tonight, let's wade into it as we sort of stepping into a creek. We'll go ankle deep, then get knee deep, and then we'll get waist deep, and I hope we'll get up to the nose before it's over tonight. Uh, but I want you to look at verse number 26. What a tremendous verse this is. I told you concerning this chapter, this is Paul's Canaan land living. This is his spirit chapter. This is, he's gone on into Canaan now and got out of the wilderness, got out of Egypt, out of the wilderness and into Canaan. Uh, that's the way God's children should live, and we can live that way by the Spirit of God. He's our prayer partner. All of us need to pray. All of us need to call upon God and talk to Him. But verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And so here's the intercession of the Spirit. That's the divine enablement. He helps our infirmities. Uh, thank God I'm glad He's my helper. I'm glad He does help me when I pray. And I, I, I try to pray and can't come up with words and they feel like they drop off of my, uh, out of my lips onto my chest. I don't even get any further than my head. Uh, out of my mouth sometimes. But He helps with that. He knows what I need to say and He takes care of that. And then we see this intercessory work is the divine enlightenment. Uh, we know not that deals with uh, any ignorance. Not only does he deal with my weakness and enabling me and helping me, but he deals with my uh, uh, in, uh, enlightenment. He deals with my ignorance and things. Of, I know not what I need to pray and how to pray, uh, but he deals with that. So what do you do, preacher? Keep on praying. When you think you're getting through and when you think you're not, just keep on talking to the Lord. You can't go wrong doing that. So thou the divine, uh, the intercessory work of the Spirit of God, He enables us by helping our weaknesses and enlightens us by helping our ignorance. And thank God He encourages us uh, and makes intercession for us by helping our insufficiency. Uh, thank God for that divine encouragement. Uh, and then in verse 27 through verse 39, He relates the rest of the chapter to the mind of the Spirit. And so we see the mind of God. Let, let me say to you tonight, uh, what a golden chain of blessings is presented unto us in verse 29 uh, and verse 30. Let's read them. I told you last week and told you there were six landmarks uh, that would never be moved and never be taken away uh, from the child of God that God would never move. Here they are. You get a hold of these precious truths and let them mature in your heart and in your life. It'll help you with your walk with God and help you with your stand with God. Now look at what he says. Of course, that classic verse in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Uh, now that verse cannot be claimed by everybody. That verse can only be claimed not by a lost person. Uh, that verse can only be claimed by people that love God and only by the saved that love God and only by the saved that are in the will of God and are walking with God. Then you can claim that. And then in verse 29, he said, tells you why. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. In whom he called, them he also justified. In whom he justified, them he also glorified. These verses should make a Presbyterian shout. Thank God it shows us that God is in not just control, but God is in complete control of everything from the creation until the consummation, until everything is taken care of and everything is wound up. And so a golden chain of blessings, predestinated, conformed, called, justified, glorified. And I would have you to observe the tense in these verses. It is in the past tense. Uh, that is a blessing to the child of God concerning our security. The whole process is viewed as in its eternal completeness. As far as God is concerned, it's a complete job. As far as God is concerned, it's a done deal. 
As far as God is concerned, these things have already taken place. And thank God, if they've already taken place, it lets me know I'm already there in the mind of God. And so here we look back, as it were, from the viewpoint of glory. And herein is the assurance of what I am speaking. Everything from predestination before history began to the glorification process and the glorified process at its end is in God's view already accomplished. And you can't go wrong doing that. You can't go wrong believing that. This, I say again, is one of the greatest, one of the greatest verses and and segments and chapters in the entire Word of God concerning the believer's full life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so in the church experience, it will be accomplished just when her course on earth is finished. That's the reason I took the time to go through that, how I know the church, according to the Bible, is not going through the tribulation period. Let me be dogmatic here. I may get flack on this by some that don't believe this. I'm not being ugly and I'm not... it's, It's fine if you believe another view, but I believe the Bible teaches us that the church will leave here before one second of the tribulation starts. I do not believe that the church will go through the tribulation period. I believe there will be suffering by the saints. I believe we, we may have to put up with a lot of suffering. There's already been a lot of suffering in a lot of places. I don't know what we'll have to go through with, but I know one thing we will not go through, and that's the tribulation. I know, and you can rest assured, if gas gets to be $10 a gallon, and the way it's going now, that's not far-fetched. If it gets to be $10 a gallon, God is still the supplier. God is still the one that takes care of our needs. God still tells us to look to Him and walk with Him and to trust Him. And so He's given us these verses tonight that God knows where we're at. God knows where the church is at. And when God accomplishes His purpose with the church, which is made up of born again, saved individuals washed in the blood of the Lamb from the day of the Pentecost until the, until the, until the rapture takes place, then you and I tonight, we can rest assured when God gets through with it, He will take us out of here. But until then, the gates of hell, listen to me, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. Thank God we are secure in Christ Jesus. If I am in the church, in the body of Christ and in the church, that means the gates of hell cannot prevail against me because the body of believers make up the church of the living God. And so we have assurance from God that it cannot take us down. We're going up, not down. Profound mysteries lie here in these verses. They are embedded in the great utterance of what Paul is telling us and what he's saying. And theologians have debated this since the first time they read the sentence. And we'll debate it until Jesus comes. But I don't care about the debate. Uh, Our obligation is not to debate it. Our obligation and our privilege is to believe it. I don't understand a lot what's even said here. Who understands the predestination of God? Who understands these deep doctrines and the things of God? Nobody can really fully say that I understand exactly what God's talking about. Oh, you've got men and preachers that wax eloquently in their ignorance on trying to explain it. But when he comes back down and you close the book, it's still God is in control. And it remains a mystery until we get to glory. And it will still remain a mystery unless God reveals it to us. And if God sees fit not to reveal it, so be it. I'm of the persuasion that I don't think it'll make a flip with anybody when we stand before Jesus and see the one that saved us by his marvelous grace. All of these things that we say we're going to ask him that are a mystery to us now, it won't matter then. But until then, we'll look at the deep truths of God and what he does reveal to us. We will thank him and praise him and give him the glory for the little bit of information he does give to us and bow with devout thanksgivings of his presence who is our Alpha and Omega. What he is, he's the beginning and the end and all in between. So with this verse 30, the doctrinal division of the epistle ends. And so here we see as the manner of the apostles whole of proceeding, the unfolding of what he's been preaching is summarized in the remaining verses. It's a summary of verse chapter 1, verse 1, through chapter 8 and verse 30. 
It's given in chapter 8, verse 31 through verse 39. What he's doing is summarizing the, 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 the message that he's preaching and, and summarizing that which he's given us in all these things that he's told us beforehand concerning salvation and sanctification. As a matter of fact, uh, with this end, we see here that he concludes to looking at this, uh, he concludes his message by reminding us of how safe we are, how secure we are, how sustained we are, and how steadfast that we should be as we gaze upon the one that saved us. Now, from condemnation to glorification is celebrated in a triumphant song here. I'm titling this tonight, The Triumphant Song of the Believer. What a song that we have that we can sing as Paul pins these words down. We've said and we've seen that the first of the three main divisions of this epistle ends with chapter number 8. And that's unfolding the philosophy of salvation as he discusses four subjects. You recall that we have discussed over the last 28 weeks, we've discussed, discussed the condemnation of mankind. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. None righteous, no, not one. We are condemned from the word go. That's the reason Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Then he sticks that word about the just shall live by faith. Three times you'll find that in the word of God. Or four times in Habakkuk, it talks about the just shall live by his faith, referring to the individual and, of course, to God, the faith that God gives us. Then in Romans, that first time, the just is talking about shall live by faith. Faith with the emphasis on the just. In Galatians, the just shall live with the emphasis on living. And then in Hebrews, the just shall live by faith, the emphasis on faith. And so therefore, Paul emphasizes we were, not, we were creatures with not even fit fuel for hell. Every one of us deserve hell. Every one of us are lost, hell-bound sinners. But God, thank God for the faith process that God initiated that faith, put it into us, and gave us the ability to cry out, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And so therefore Paul says the condemnation part, you are condemned already, as John tells us in his gospel. And so the salvation aspect has to do with condemnation. But he says, have no fear. Justification is here. Thank God, justification by God Himself is a legal term that God has eliminated our sins, washed them away, cleansed us and made us whole and lifted us out of condemnation and given us eternal life. Here it comes through Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord. And so he deals with these two major important doctrines in the Word of God, condemnation, justification, and then this word sanctification. Uh, we've spent the last three chapters looking at sanctification where God saves you and He sets you apart. Maybe when we finish this chapter, God will let me go into that doctrine of sanctification. God knows it's a need in our day. I have that we are to be set apart for the glory of God and that progressive sanctification that takes place uh, that will be sanctifying us until we get to glory. There's a lot of things I want to go into when I finish this chapter. Uh, there's the things about the last days, the last times. What's that talking about? There's the thing about Gog and Magog. Russia. What's that talking about? What does the Bible say about the United States? Uh, what does the Bible say about these armors that's going up? What's the Bible say about these times that we are in now? Paul says, have no fear. Wars and rumors of war, Jesus told us about. Earthquakes in many places. Things are going to be phenomenal that we've never heard of and seen in our day. Look up, your redemption draweth nigh. Don't let that sidetrack you. Don't let that get you cold and indifferent. Don't let that get you a place where you say, what's the use? We ought to be having a hot, hot for God and let it be burning now more than it ever has, hotter than it ever has because we are closer than we've ever been to Jesus Christ coming back to taking us out of here. But until then, we've got some major words. We've got some major doctrines. We've got some major things that we can look to and rest assured and stand on the foundational principles that will never be cracked, never be moved and never be broken. These landmarks that God has given us and then he winds up, as we'll see tonight, with glorification. I'm going to have a glorified body. As far as God's concerned, I'm already glorified. So let me ask you a question, you out there that have been misled or you that have misinterpreted Scripture. And you may be sitting here tonight, I hope no one here believes this. But how in the name of God's heaven, if in God's eyes, 
We that are saved are already glorified, seated in heavenly places with Jesus Christ. Could we ever get out of that body? It don't get any more eternal than that. Yeah, but what if you sin? What about it? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a whole doctrinal process of sanctification. We are not perfect by a long shot. Yeah, but it says we died uh, with Christ. If I'm dead, how's a dead man sin? Well, I'm going to tell you this. Uh, that's a judicial act that we died with him, that he took our sins and he did all that. I've got the innate nature that I've had since I have been born into this world and will stay with me till I go to glory. Uh, that's the word I told you to never forget. The natural man always refers to the unsaved man. But then there's a word that you as a child of God, we use too much and too loosely as carnal. That has to do with the saved man. The spiritual has to do with the saved man. And the word carnal has to do with the spiritual man uh, that is acting like a natural man. But yet he does not continue to practice that and continue to walk that path according to Galatians chapter 5. Because if he does that, he's never been saved to start with. And so therefore we get whipped, Romans chapter 12, if we are disobedient to God and we go astray with God. I don't know how, how bad the whippings are and don't know how long God will let you get by with, in your sin. But if you are God's, you can rest assured he's sanctifying you. He's molding you and making you into the image of his son. He predestinated you to make you into the image of his son. And so God's not going to let that go. God's going to take care of all of that. So Paul says, uh, says, says, put on the whole arm of God and get this thing. We're going to have a glorified body one of these days. And so at the first two subjects, he summarized his argument, tracing condemnation to Adam. He said, all have sinned because of one man, Adam. Wherefore, it's by one man sin into through the world, and death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. He spent much on that, telling us that we are condemned in Adam. We are sinners in Adam. By one man, but thank God by one man all have been made righteous. Jesus Christ, our precious Lord. Hallelujah. Thank God the condemnation has been lifted. And so our just condemnation is in Adam, but our justification is in Christ. And so here he proceeds to discuss sanctification and glorification. And this being done, he summarizes the whole argument from condemnation to glorification celebrated in this triumphant song. Surely, as one of the great old Puritan writers penned in one of his commentaries, surely this must be one of the most eloquent passages in all literature. And I believe with him he is right. When we read these words of what we're saying, and we can divide this magnificent passage into two portions, and that's what I want to do. In the treatment of each of the apostles' well nigh exhaust thoughts and language, both relate to the believer's security. It's all over it. You can't get any further. You can't go any better than that. And assuring us of glory. But verse 31 through verse 34 tells us, and you need to pin this down, the reality of our security. It's just not something that we are just bumping our lips together about or something we've come up with to make us feel good. It's real. It's a reality. Once God has saved you, He secures you. John 10 tells us that. Thank God for that reality that we have. You can never be lost once you've been saved. Save your letters, save your phone calls, saying all of that. You're not going to convince me of any difference. I'm telling you, I am sealed, I am saved, and it's absolutely impossible for me to get lost. Uh, it's, it's no way under God's heaven can I ever be lost again. Do I disappoint God? Yes, many times. Do I, do I go against God? Yes, many times. Is God disappointed with me? Does God have to whip me? Yes, I'm his child. He has the right to do that. Uh, but thank God, I'm glad it doesn't take me as long to get back on track as it used to. And I'm thankful tonight that I belong to him. And hallelujah for this language that we have before us. The condemnation has been lifted. The condemnation has been taken off. There's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Starts the chapter off that way telling us that. Then these beautiful words, this language for 39 verses winds up with no separation from God Almighty. So we can never be separated from God and we'll show you that in just a moment. Notice he says here, I like these words in verse number 31. He says, what shall we then say to these things? What shall we say to the what things? To these things. What things is he talking about? Everything that has gone before in this epistle. Put out in your margin chapter 1 verse 1 to chapter 8 and verse 30. 
Everything has been said up until now. What you going to say about that? Because he's used that and unloaded on everything. What shall we say to these things? Everything that's gone on. The challenge is thrown out. Who can be against us? There is uh, innumerable adversaries every, ever ready and eager to oppress the people of God and to go against the people of God and to tear down the people of God and to say, you don't know what you're talking about. But we are standing on the book. We are standing on the word. And so when Paul says, who can, he does not mean that there are none that, that can't. He, he, what he's saying here, there are none that can, but there are none that can do so with any hope of success. Oh, they, can, they can accuse and they can say this and they can say that. You've got people, I've had people to tell me, you don't know that you're saved. Quite frankly, I don't like being called a liar. When I say I know I'm saved and you say I don't know I'm saved, you're calling me a liar. Uh, you, you may not know you're saved, but I'm going to tell you one thing. You have no right to say I don't know I'm saved. But I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved not by the little filthy works that I do. I don't have any works. But thank God, His works, the finished work on Calvary, because of what He's done, I'm sealed. I'm set through. You can, you can say anything you want to about that. You can charge me and say all the things you want to. So He's not saying there are none that can, but there are none that can do so with any hope of success because they have Almighty God to reckon with. And if you've got to reckon with God, you, you better just take a back seat, friend. You're going to lose. You've lost already when you try to open your mouth against Him. And so he, having given his own son to die for us, will not let his enemies damage the security of his people. Wouldn't it be absurd if Jesus Christ went to the cross, shed his blood, went through all that suffering, died for his people, and then after he, he saved your soul, some little thing that you've done, some little thing that, you didn't, that God didn't like, then he turned his back on you and took his salvation away from you. That would say he died in vain. And Jesus Christ didn't do anything in vain. Having asked a question about opposition and answered it, Paul now asked a question about acquisition and answers it. Accusation and answers it. I, I, I follow this by, he showed it's six of them in all. Uh, this, this gives us a, a force to the paragraph. Let's read each question that implies the answer of an emphatic no. Notice he says, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Who is he that condemneth? No one can be condemned who is not charged, but the apostle separates the two ideas here. And what Paul says and answers the challenge about the charge by asking with the incredibility. Another question. Will the God who has justified his people bring fatal charge against them? And the answer Paul says, and you don't see it here, but is no. He will never do that. Where that possible justification would be of no avail. If a man could lose his salvation and God could bring a charge against him after he'd relieved him of those charges. Sin may charge us. Satan may charge us. The law may charge us. Our own conscience and our hearts may charge us. But let me remind you tonight, thank God, if we have believed, God has justified us. And thank God all accusers are silenced for the charges are no longer valid. God, uh, valid. God will say, which sins are you talking about? Who are you talking about? I see one person. That's my son, Jesus Christ. Because everything God does for us, from saving us to answering our prayer to coming to get us and rapture us out of here, is for his son's sake, Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is saying in these words here. Now, this notwithstanding, the apostle asked a further question in these verses. He said, who is he that condemneth? And for the answer, he asked four questions in rapid succession of questions which summarize the whole Christian gospel, the whole of the whole gospel that we preach. Will Christ condemn us who died for us? And the answer is no. Will Christ condemn us who rose again for us? And the answer is no. Will Christ condemn us who is now at God's right hand for us? And the answer is no. Will Christ condemn us who is forever interceding for us? And the answer is a thousand times no. No, 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 no. Christ is crucifixion. Christ is resurrection. Christ is ascension. And Christ is intercession. Make the condemnation of his people an utterly impossibility. Both the charge and the condemnation are absolutely impossible. For both were accepted and discharged on Calvary by the sinless Lamb of God. 
Hallelujah. What a promise we have in his precious book. Now we are free. There's no condemnation. Jesus provided a perfect salvation. And so the matter of the believer's security is as certain as God can make it. And if God's making it, that's all that really, really matters. Thank God as we have here tonight the answer to the, he asked five questions with six really being our, then he takes five more after he answers that first question. And these five questions I'll answer and we'll go to the house. The answer to the five questions. What shall we then say to these things? The first answer is, God's person is invincible. If God be for us, who can be against us? That's in verse 31. God's person is invincible. God is invincible. The who of opposition is not worthy of even a thought if such a God is for us. If divinity is for us, then we fear all combined, shall we feel all combined humanity. It makes no difference who is against us if God is for us. But if God is against us, it makes no difference who is for us. But Paul is saying here, thank God, it makes no difference who's against us. God is for us. So it makes no difference tonight. Thank God. If omnipotence is for us, shall we fear a malligated impotence? Absolutely not. If heaven is for us, shall we fear united hell? I'll never have to worry about going to hell. My Bible tells me hell is a horrible place. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Hell is the place people will spend eternity that are condemned. Hell is the place that people will go that do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Hell is a place where if the blood has not been applied, then you're not clean enough to go to heaven. And the blood I'm talking about is not blood of bulls and goats, as Hebrews tells us, but the blood of God himself, the blood of Jesus Christ, our precious Lord. Has thou not known? Hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is worthy? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. We are told that in the Old Testament by the prophet Isaiah in chapter number 40 in verse 28 and 29. So he answers this question, this first question that's asked here as he winds this doctrinal aspect up. Uh, God's person is invincible. If God be for us, who can be against us? The second answer he asks to that second question. God's grace is inexhaustible. He, verse 32, he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? So we see the inexhaustible God here. We see the invincible God here. We see the God the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this inexhaustible God with his grace shows us that his grace is inexhaustible in its mystery. The grace of God is a mystery. Why God would do anything for sinful man is a mystery. But anything that God does for mankind is grace. Thank God he spoke to us. Thank God he covered us. Thank God he saved us. Thank God he supplies for us. Thank God grace, grace, marvelous grace. I thank God for the amazing grace of God. That's the reason we call it amazing. It is amazing grace. Inexhaustible in its mystery. So it says here, he that spared not his own son. So the Bible tells us that God spared not the old world, but poured his wrath out upon the universe in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. It also tells us that God spared not the angels who sinned, but destroyed one-third of the celestial race uh, when they fell in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 4 in Revelation 12, 4. The Bible also tells us that God spared not unbelieving Israel, but judged even the chosen race for their awful sin of rejecting his son in Romans chapter 11 and verse 21. It also tells us uh, many things that God did not spare. And so uh, that did, God did spare. We can understand something of the justice of these spared not. God spared not. But when we read that God spared not his own son, this is grace inexhaustible in its mystery. But thank God he didn't spare him. Thank God he didn't come off the cross. Thank God he didn't want to get out of it. 
Every time I think about that, I think about people that believe that Jesus Christ could. Uh, they was trying to get out of dying and then Gethsemane when he was praying. That's not what he was asking the Father to do. He was asking to be any other way other than that fellowship be broken for those three hours because it's the first time that's ever in eternity that fellowship had been broken between God the Father and God the Son. And God turned his back, so to speak. He saw the travail of his soul, uh, but as far as his fellowship with him and the communion with him for three hours in that dire darkness, three hours uh, in that suffering that he took, being beyond a pulp that men could not even recognize him as a man. He said, if it be any other way, other than fellowship be broken, he said, let it pass. But then he said, what you and I ought to pray before we get off our knees every time we pray. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And so if it bothered him for the fellowship to be broken for three hours, knowing it would be restored, why well, he became sin for mankind, to take hell for mankind. If it bothered him for that, how much more should it bother us when we don't have fellowship with the Father or with the Son? God help us. Paul has given us here grounds to call upon him. He says it's inexhaustible in its mystery, but it's inexhaustible in its miracle, but delivered him up for us all. That was a miracle. To give his son for angels we might understand, but to give him for me, that's an inexhaustible miracle of grace. Ian Paisley says it like this. How amazing God's compassion that so vile a worm might prove that stupendous bliss of heaven the amazing wealth of love. He loved me and gave himself for me. End of quote. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 20. For God loved us. Thank God he has made, he, he is in us and we crucified with him and we live with him and our life is with him. Uh, for me to live is Christ. And I'm thankful tonight. Thank God for that inexhaustible grace. That's a mystery, but it's a miracle. And God's grace is inexhaustible in its magnitude. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? God's grace is inexhaustible in this magnitude. With his son, God freely give us all things. You know you have grace tonight. It's free. Salvation is free. But we spent eight chapters showing you it's not free by heaven. We've spent eight chapters showing you what God went to the extent of to make sure you could be saved and you could walk with Him and have fellowship with Him and live with Him. Thank God for the amazing grace of God. All of yours and ye are crisis and Christ is God's, Corinthians 3, 22 and 23. And so we have here uh, that, that God's grace is inexhaustible. Uh, God's person is invincible. The third answer to this question, this third question, God's grace is inexhaustible, but the third answer is God's verdict is incontrovertible. Incontrovertible. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies in verse 33. And so the infinite, that unlimited God justifies. The eternal God justifies. The unchangeable God justifies. And thank God he justifies in wisdom. He justifies in power. He justifies in holiness. He justifies in justice. He justifies in goodness. And he justifies in truth. And so this verse is, this, this verdict is incontrovertible. The elect are cleared forever. With thought and accuser, the accuser roar of ills that I have done, I know them well and thousands more. Jehovah finds none. What sins are you talking about? Thank God they've been forgiven. We've been set free forevermore. The fourth answer. God's pardon is un incontestable. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ, verse 34, that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also can make intercession for us, in verse number 34. And so here, God's pardon is incontestable. Can Christ's substitution be contested? You can cry, try all you want to. It can never be done. Praise God. It is Christ that died. Can Christ's supplication be contested, who also has risen again? Can Christ's sovereignty be contested, who is even at the right hand of God? Can Christ's supplication be contested, who also make intercession for us? I say not. Thank God we are set free. We have God's pardon. We have been given that which no one else has. Only the child of God that has received the free grace of God 
can look to these words and sing this song with joy in his soul. Then there's a fifth answer. God's bond is inseparable. Notice what he says here in verse 35 through verse 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. It can be easily seen that there are two sets of circumstances which Paul lists in these verses. The circumstances before death. Is seen in verse 35 through verse 37, seven of them. These things come before death, tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, pearl, sword. Seven is one of the scriptural numbers of completion and perfection. Everything God does is perfect and incomplete. And so he gives seven in number here of the circumstances before death. And so the complete onslaught of every foe before death cannot separate us from the love of God. Can tribulation separate us? Absolutely not. Can distress? Can persecution? Can famine? All these things can happen. These things that's happening in our day. Couldn't the COVID separate us from the love of God? To look at some people, you would think they thought it did. But I'm going to tell you, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing. No, nothing. I, I hope I, I don't. I make this statement with hesitation. But if God took everything I have, if I'd done right, I would still be loved by God and say, God, you have done, you are God, you do what you want. What seems good to you is no, no problem with me. Give me the grace and he will at the time. I hope he doesn't challenge me on that. And I hope I'll stand the test. Nobody wants to lose everything they've got. But if I did, it would not separate me from the love of God. No matter what we come up against and what disease we have or what sickness we have or what cancer we may face, it does not separate us from the love of God. God loves us and nothing can separate us. He's spending this time winding down this tremendous doctrine telling us there's no separation for those that have condemnation that has been lifted from them. The devil will try to make you think God doesn't love you. People will try to make you think that God doesn't help you. But I want you to know there's nothing that can separate us. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Uh, The circumstances after death, verse 38 and verse 39. That's, That's a little taste of what we'll see next week. We'll wind this up and look at this in this fifth answer. I I've got some more things that I want. I don't want to hurriedly get through this, and I don't want to bore you with any of this. So we will wind this chapter up, the Lord willing, next time. Father, I want to thank you so much tonight for watching over me. Thank you for the love of God that shed abroad in my heart. Thank you tonight, Lord, for the people you've sent this way. Thank you for making it possible for us to preach the gospel to every creature. Help us now to do what we do for your glory. We'll be very careful to praise you 